he doesn't say action. No. <laughs> he just says turning over and the rest of our lives are portrayed as a kind of existential documentary, all in real time. Hello and welcome to this episode of, um, I guess it's Obscurama? Yeah. And this time we're talking about literature and publishing because, would you believe it, me and Tom are authors in this wonderful compendium of horror short stories. Uh, which is distributed by Sarah Daly's mm -hmm. publishing company um, called Hex Arcana Publishing. And this book is called The Book of Beastly Creatures. And we're going to talk a little bit about some of the short stories we wrote mm -hmm. and our approaches. And um, we're kind of taking it in painful turns. You know, I will be interviewing Tom about his stories first, and then a far more strange and perverse video <coughs> will see the reverse. Um, Correct. So you actually wrote 26 stories for, <laughs> it for them. It feels like it. Right. <laughs> um, but you've um, given me five yeah. that you would um, you, you, you find the most interesting mm -hmm. to discuss. Yeah. Um, it's should... mostly because I can't re remember <laughs> how I came up with some of them. So I, I guess we should say that each of the stories had a kind of required element. It was like a, well, a beastly creature. Yeah. And that's quite a soft name. But really, these are quite, well, these are hard horror stories. Mm -hmm. Um, in the cover art, we have this amazing illustration by James Ollie of these Lovecraftian kind of denizens and creatures, mm. and and he uh, produced a wonderful illustration for each of the stories, mm. which I'll have to share with the audience as well. That'd be great. Um, but if we go to the first one, um, then it is a story called "And It Walked from the Sea into the Sea." Oh. And it walked into the sea, yeah. and uh, to show the illustration mm -hmm. um, as well, there we we have it, mm. there. Um, and it shows a kind of, almost like a kind of Edwardian gent with a lantern mm. fighting against a hideous, um, if it was a particularly uh, Lovecraftian grammatical phrase of uh, mind, I would have a good word, a kind of like an eldritch horror, but yeah. it's, it's not quite eldritch. It's, it's, it's certainly a... It's definitely Lovecraftian, I suppose. A fishy thing. A fishy thing. With many yeah. teeth. With many teeth. I thought that was essential, that it had these kind of puckered holes. Now, in the illustration, the monster's mouths appear to be shaped like kind of like fanged vaginas. Was that your intention? And yes. why? <laughs> I don't know, just some sort of um, Freudian, Freudian slip. Freudian slip. Well, to be fair, the works of H.P. Lovecraft are all Freudian intensely slips. Freudian yeah, slips, yeah. 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 Um, so, in And It Walked Into The Sea, we have uh, a gentleman who goes back to his hometown. No. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, without giving too much of the plot away. Um, but that's what we're trying to avoid. Yeah, yeah he's basically in trying to find out what happened to his wife, who he presumes dead and missing. Right, and, and, and what is now was last reported in this strange community. Yeah, he that's receives right. a clue yeah, yeah, yeah. that brings him to a very strange uh, village, kind of almost in a Wicker Man style. They've mm -hmm. kind of got a festival that seems a bit odd, and he's kind of drawn to... Um, ask the locals questions about his wife and he gets embroiled in a kind of a, a conspiracy and perhaps his own downfall as well. So, and it involves a horrifying creature. I remember when I read this story, you did capture the sense of, or the atmosphere of the festival very well. Yeah. Uh, but with this kind of uncanny vibe that there was something dark yeah. reverberating underneath. Yeah, I think it definitely the Wicker Man was the big inspiration because you're sort of drawn into the pagan aspects of their society. So you're you're a fan of the Wicker Man. Love and, it, and it was... yeah. I, I think it's because sometimes you, you side with the villagers sometimes mm -hmm. in, in a weird way because you're, you're kind of like put off by... Um, Oh God, Sergeant! I forget his name. What the? In, in the Wicker Man, the Sergeant. Oh, yeah. You're put off by his kind of um, his piousness and mm -hmm. his and his kind of rigid demeanor, and you're kind of and then you side with the villagers, and then suddenly 
that's pulled apart. But it, it was it, just a tiny hint of that came into making this a very attractive kind of village. And um, it was also inspired by the villages in Scotland, in Fife particularly. Um, There's a lot of coastal villages on yeah. the end of Fife. Yeah, yeah. And they're kind of, uh, even though, like, even in the modern sense, some of them are quite isolated, which is weird. Mm -hmm. Like, um, for example, West Weems, which appears to only have one road going into it, mm -hmm. which always disturbed me <laughs> a little bit. Because uh, sometimes it gets, um, they get stranded there because of snow and all that kind of thing. So it's just kind of. So for this anthology, that story was the was that the first one that I wrote. Yeah, I, I think the below was the first right. one I wrote. That might have been the second one I wrote, and that's kind of when I hit my stride. So a little bit. when you hit your stride, then what was the approach that you took to constructing this short story? Um, I think I knew what was going to happen at the very end. Mm -hmm. Um. That was important because I struggle. I know that some people just kind of start writing. I hate those people. Mm -hmm. They can just start a story, uh, don't know where it's going, and finish it. Like or you know, whereas I have to know the ending. Otherwise, I I wouldn't be able to put pen to paper. So I kind of started with the the very end scene, and more or less worked my way backwards. How did that get to that? How did that get to that? How did that get to that? So do you take quite a bit of time trying to construct the start, middle and end yeah. before yeah, yeah. Right. before I approach it? Otherwise, I'm, I'm, I'm lost. There's maybe one or two stories where I did actually just start it without knowing the end. But um, And sometimes that's easier to do when you're trying to capture a singular moment, yeah. like an incident that is going to occur almost yeah. in real time rather than something with plot. I think so, because mm. short stories especially when you have a creature involved, it's much easier to just m m envision the ending mm -hmm. uh, in that way. And so in that, that that was the easiest thing to do. I mean, for me, th that story in particular certainly evokes the, the Lovecraftian charms, um, but as you mentioned with The Wicker Man, there is a kind of folkloric horror, yeah. and that, that does seem to take... Um, some inspiration from, from, yeah, from the villages of Scotland, but also your own Irish... Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Ancestry. absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Like uh, small town um, mindsets and sometimes superstitions and folklores that carry on. Of this, the five, would you say this story best expresses your style as a writer, or is it still, yeah. or is it more like a formative? No, it definitely does, and I think it's the one that I would be the most eager to adapt into a film. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's got everything I love, which is like. The vaginas. The vaginas. Like, see, anything to do with... I, I'm terrified of the ocean. I don't like it at all. Mm -hmm. But I do love everything to do with the maritime. So, uh, especially the kind of folklore that comes out of it. Mm. So, so. Very good. Very good. I think that's that's good. I'm, I'm now going to go into your next story. Yes. And that one is Tooth. Tooth. So um, again, I, I'm going to show our wonderful audience uh, the artwork yeah. for Tooth. Um, if you can <laughs> see it more or less. I'm, yeah. I'm sure we will have cutaways as well. <laughs> yeah. So Tooth is, I, I quite like Tooth. It's pretty crazy to me. Mm. I, I felt like, um, well, the former story had a, a quite a, a classical investigative conspiratorial structure with mm. the Lovecraftian and folkloric horror. Um, this felt almost like the kind of the adaptation of a kind of Brothers Grimm fairy tale, um, mm. something of a moral fable about it. Yeah. Um, and um, again, without going into spoilers, but we're, we're, we're talking about. Um, a legendary creature uh, or the, the ability to become that creature mm -hmm. and and it kind of well, feels like a curse around that as well yeah I so mean, it's a classic curse story mm -hmm. a revenge curse story much like you know I don't know I can't remember anything literary, <laughs> literary but uh, you know something like Ringu or you know that kind of thing where you do something horrendous to somebody and they 
they curse they curse you afterwards well there, there is a, a kind of a subtext about um abuse and things as well isn't there uh yeah a little uh the, the, it's not even a subtext i mean the 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 the, the, the creature at the heart of the story relate or uh, has come to be because of abuse so um it, the the abuse sort of carries on or renders a, a or creates a, a kind of a curse around it so kind of like i don't know i can't I'm struggling to think <laughs> but um yeah there's there's a there's a bit of, there's a slight element of um talk wanting to talk about abuse as well so that is is that the central theme for this story um I would say yes, but I, oh, look, I mean, I obviously a story is so much more than some of its parts. So yeah, what we I mean, as a singular theme. I mean, it, mo most of these stories would come from my uh, like some particular thing that I'm fascinated by, mm -hmm. and this came from a fascination with a particular uh, building in Dublin, in the mountains of, in Dub near Dublin, called the Hellfire. Or, or well, it was. Um, Montpellier House, it's called. Is that the the, the rumored site of the Hellfire yeah, Society? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You so, have to explain what that is to the audience. Well, it's uh, the Hellfire Club. I think it was like um, a society that was created in the I don't know, maybe the 18th century. Right. Um, and it was basically just you know a gentleman's club, I would imagine, card games and all that. But like so many things back then, rumors and 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 legends started to be associated with the club you know like devil worshipping and mysticism and magic and all that kind of thing and so and I kind of like all of that yes um, um, you know especially stuff uh, surrounding Yeats and maybe even um, what's his name Crowley mm -hmm. that kind of Alistair thing Crowley, Alistair yeah. Crowley so um, I kind of like I kind of liked that these people thought that they were mystics and wizards and stuff like that, and I kind of wanted to bring that element. And they've into kind it. of they find themselves a little bit out of their depth. <laughs> yeah, I, I loved the idea of them being out of their depth. Uh, I thought because um, quite often they're they're seen as confident and mm -hmm. quite um, mystical, and I kind of wanted to make them more human, a bit more uh, brutal, and um, more prone to making mistakes and a bit you know. Normally, w with uh, a lot of horrors, when people are transformed into monsters or things mm. like that, they tend it tends not to be a big pig. Yeah. Why the pig? Uh, well, that's part of the. Uh, that's kind of a spoiler. Right. So it's it's yeah. kind of part of what happens to the. the it's kind ah, of associated okay. with what happens to the to the person. Right. So you've you've taken the, the 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 nature of the abuse, the tragedy, and looked yeah. for ways to express that yeah. as the yeah, yeah the, the unlikely mm -hmm. horrific alter ego yeah. brought to life. Um, tooth um like feels like a very different story, and and it's it's a, it's a nice expression really of of the difference in your style um from what i would describe as a kind of as a, com a conventional um horror narrative mm -hmm. to something that is um quite um sardonic mm -hmm. but at the same time earnest mm -hmm. as well and um and i think i think that's quite refreshing mm -hmm. and it certainly is is one one i think one of your best stories in the, in the, oh, in the collection very much. cheers um so we can look to um, another one. And that would be the mold. Yeah. Ah. Now, in this illustration, as you can see, uh, the famous US physicist, Oh, I can't remember his name. Tyson. Neil deGrasse Tyson. Neil deGrasse Tyson is being hauled towards a ceiling by a hideous, uh, it's like um, -like creature. AI generated art. <laughs> give, give me Neil deGrasse Tyson being swallowed by a mold. A range of monsters. Yeah. Um, the artist uh, James Ollie did a fantastic He's job amazing. with all the illustrations. Amazing. But in the first version of this, hmm. 
<laughs> Neil deGrasse Tyson was looking straight at you, the onlooker, yeah. which made it maybe just a little bit too funny. <laughs> Way too funny, and yeah. So. I mean, it's still pretty, yeah. pretty, pretty it's hilarious. horrific, but yeah, it's yeah. horrific and hilarious. Mm -hmm. it's, it's hilarious to those who have a macabre taste, and you know, with you know, funny to those who are aficionados of the horror genre. Yeah. Um, now, me and, and my sister, when we were growing up, one of our favourite horror films that creeped us out the most was the 1988 remake of The Blob yeah. that Frank Darabont um, wrote. Um, and anything like this, mm -hmm. any kind of brainless, yucky stuff that mm -hmm. effectively goes for people, yeah. consumes them, it's just, it's like a giant amoeba, you know, that kind of yeah. alien yuckiness is just that's, that's always given me shivers yeah um like shivers like shivers <laughs> so like, so um tell me a little bit about your inspirations and ideas behind the mold because unlike mm. the, the other stories this is not a complex plot no but it's describing very richly and and and, and yeah gratuitous detail um the, the horrifying incident and that's because like i find moles utterly repellent uh, is that the right word mm -hmm. just utterly disgusting um i think when i was writing the other stories i kind of went into my bathroom and it, it felt like it had not been there the previous day but there was like a ring a giant ring of black mold on the ceiling oh and i was like so weirded out by the fact that i'd not seen it or noticed it before and it just kind of came out of that i was just like I know it's it's kind of shocky to just think, oh, what happens if a mold's in somebody's house, <laughs> and you know. But I just got into the detail of how disgusting it could possibly be, mm -hmm. and when you're watching movies where something is disgusting, um, you know, like The Thing or The Blob or anything like that, you know, it's very easy for them to make it look disgusting, whereas actually writing how to make it actually writing it down in prose how, how to you know well it, it requires a, a bit of grotesque poetry yeah really. it does yeah you know it's kind of it requires a clive barker level of um you know of writing that i don't possess but um he does but like i tried my best to make it as disgusting as possible i mean this is probably the closest um any of your stories get to a cronenberg type yeah definitely kind of, kind of feel um, you mentioned some famous horror writers there, mm. and often folks ask, you know, if is there any writers that you take inspiration from? Mm. Um, but that's a it's a, a bit of a tricky question, that isn't it? Yeah, I mean, horror writers. I it's to my shame I haven't read a great number of them. Like I've read some a, a scattering of short stories from a lot of them. Mm -hmm. You know, Stephen King, uh, John Buchan and um, Poe mm -hmm. and um, Clyde Barker and a few others like that are names escape me right now. But um, yeah, so it's kind of hard to just, I don't think I picked one writer, King, mm -hmm. uh, and um, and read their entire works or mm -hmm. like that. So, I, you know, if someone asks me what my favorite horror writer is, I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that kind of thing. But yeah, I'm trying to. I mean, you also you come from a film background as yeah. well, and, and that will change, because effectively, although um, we both really enjoy writing, mm -hmm. you know, we're we're filmmakers as well. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if that makes us feel sometimes that we're not truly part of the writer's world. Mm, although definitely. you know we've published our story. Yeah. <laughs> and, we, and we write a lot. Yeah, I mean, but you kind of imagine, don't you, sometimes that uh, that that quote unquote real writers might you know have many mugs of black coffee mm -hmm. and a typewriter and a revolver with you know fully loaded, mm -hmm. which actually is like us anyway, but yeah. for, for film. Yeah, I think uh, when we did this, it felt like because we were, it felt like we were only scratching the tiniest surface of the horror literary world because mm. it's just enormous and I don't think we um, yeah you're right we're, you know we're only kind of little fleas on, on the backside yeah of, of that world I mean 
Um, at least with the publishing company um, that Sarah started, that we're trying to help, we're looking to champion new writing. And admittedly, that kind of starts with our writing, really, doesn't it? Um, although we have just done a book with uh, Sean Hogan. He's done one of our first novels, the mm -hmm. Lord of Tears novelization. So we can't be accused of hogging the limelight with our own no. mediocrity. <laughs> no, definitely not. And we are definitely looking forward to seeing what other people bring to the table as well. Yeah, for sure. Um, but I think sometimes, I imagine most writers probably feel a certain degree of a kind of slight imposter syndrome, though. Sure, definitely. A, a little bit. You yeah, know, I would hope that most of them do. But at least, like, for me, you know, when we make films... It's a collaborative effort, mm. and although undue credit and, and blame is sometimes given to directors and things like that, mm. it's still more or less something that can kind of be like spread around a yeah, lot of people. Absolutely. But with yeah. a, a story, it's it's very intimate. It's from yeah. your own imagination, your it's soul. It's just you. It's just you on the mm. cover. Like so, there's no there's no one else to blame or reward for, yeah. for that effort. Uh, so you, you you can kind of. Um, yeah, it's kind of an unwritten understanding, like that films are are collaborative and mm. that, that they, you know, you can walk away from them a little bit more. But this is this is really your own thing. It's your personal, I mean, skill. And it's really nice, like as well. It can't be underst <laughs> understated as well. Um, how lucky we are to be published in a hardback book. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, beautifully printed. I mean, like, let's face it, like most authors self publish, they'll be on Creative Space making PDFs that mm -hmm. you download for like sure. three ninety nine, and it's totally understandable why. Um, but um, but this book yeah. it has been quite successful. To have it actually in a book and have all of these illustrations is amazing. Yeah, like it's actually it, extraordinary. No, it is. It, it, it does. It plays with your head a little bit. You, even when you look at like the. <laughs> the, the author's section at the back, you know, there's these mug shots of us. <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, yeah, this actually yeah. happened. Yeah, that actually happened. Mm. How, how dare it? <laughs> um, but I think that kind of humility is a good quality to retain as a writer. Mm. I've seen some self-published type authors who have obviously gone insane. They've mm -hmm. written like 100 novelettes and now they describe themselves as best-selling and they've just gone they've clearly gone mad mm -hmm. like their, their facebook posts every day are like why have i not been appreciated yet i'm yeah. a best-selling author ah, ah, ah. the only thing i'm interested in is getting better <laughs> at writing <laughs> that's that's kind of like yeah i even even if they're not i'm not interested in these these i'm not interested in personal success with writing novels i just want to like write the best story I can. Yeah. Like, that's what satisfies me. I don't, you know, if not, if you know. No, I think, I think for me, like, I think, I've always really enjoyed the short story as a form. Yeah. Um, within the horror genre, the short story is probably, is utterly celebrated, unlike any other genre, really. In fact, there's no other literary genre that places such a, an emphasis on the, the power of the short story than horror. Yeah. yeah, we have whole authors whose uh, bibliographies, you know, they are are really just their short stories mm -hmm. and are famous for it, like Edgar Allan Poe and Henry James and M. R. James mm -hmm. and Lovecraft. You know, the list goes on, um, and I find that fun because um, it it gives you kind of like some role models you can look at, sure. and it's like you know, it's like, okay, yeah, I can write these short stories and maybe build a wee thing up. But there's a part of me as well, like uh, in terms of what I would like to achieve, I would love to write a, a novel, um, time permitting with work. Mm. Um, but it would be like a pulp fiction novel, you mm. know, like a sixty thousand word, like a short novel, sure. basically, um, like those um, horror paperbacks that we um, mm. that we all remember so fondly from the seventies and eighties, which is something that we're looking to publish mm. more of. Um, so if I, I move to your next story, the bog. Ah, uh, yes. The Bug, 141. Ah, yeah, another fantastic illustration as well. That's probably one of my favourites. Yeah, it's really cool to have mm -hmm. these colour plates. Mm -hmm. 
in, in this. So we are going um, deep into the realms of Irish folklore yeah. with, with the, the bog. You, you have to tell us a little bit about the legend. Well, I mean, I definitely sort of bastardized it. Um, it's based on, because when you were asking, the task was to create a creature yep. and then write a story about it. And so quite, a, quite often what I would do is I would look at websites and articles about various mythology, mm -hmm. Irish mythology, just to kind of get some inspiration. And one of them I came across was a thing called Far Gertha, um, which is like the, I think it's like the Hungry Man or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I believe it came out of the famine during Ireland. It was kind of a, a legend or a myth. And it's basically just an emaciated man who begs for, for help and food and, and for money. Um, I could be getting that slightly wrong, but if you help them, you receive good fortune. And that's kind of it. But it's, it's, like a, it's like a kind of um, a fairy then. Not, not a Disney fairy, but, yeah. uh, but more the fairies of... Uh, or they've got that different word for that, isn't it? It's not a fairy, a bogle. Something like that, yeah. Well, maybe in Scotland we call them bogles. Yeah. I think um, they're like fairies that can be good news or bad news, depending on... Yeah. And I sort of, I sort of took that and went, well, what happens if you don't? Mm -hmm. And then the bog element comes from I'm my home county, Offaly, um, quite a lot of peatland there, quite a lot of bogland. So I'm very familiar with that terrain, and lots of lots of different things come out of um, legends come out of the bog, like mm -hmm. um, Jack O' Lantern. Yeah, yeah. That comes from Will o' the Wisp, which was an Irish kind of legend. Yeah. About a fire, a mysterious fire in the bog, and if you follow, it's supposed to be a guy who couldn't get into heaven or hell, and he's. And if you followed it, it wasn't a good idea. Um. Yeah. If you follow it, it brings you to it. It's like treacherous. Yeah. Like, yeah. So it's kind of a composite of different Irish mythologies and yeah that creature came out about it and it's just three guys stranded on a bog trying to get back to like the the road so d d tell me about the three guys because yeah. you have with with the, with the creature uh, a, a monster that is inspired by that tragic historical events yeah. you know the the the, the, the famine in the 19th mm. century um, and it's something very powerful for for a legend to derive from mm. a tragic cultural, societal, mm. political event, yeah, um, that is so profound that mm. it can create something um, yeah. with the, a supernatural reputation. Mm. Um, so, who you choose to pit against it is also quite interesting. You know, yeah. so with these three guys, uh, what are they like? I mean, they're just. Um, I thought that they would be. It would almost feel like. Um, three bickering it's like the three bickering salesmen from the league of gentlemen that oh, kind yeah. of thing um, it was just there were three bickering co-workers and i just wanted to uh, i i kind of wanted their i wanted their story to be naturalist so that when this happens it becomes a completely different story you know there's a lot of films out there where it's a very naturalistic opening and mm -hmm. then suddenly it just turns and i kind of that was kind of so their relationship is very much conversationalist it's very uh, normal sounding mm -hmm. and there's no big characters like mm -hmm. there's just no one that usurps the other one in terms of of personality so i wanted that because then i wanted the the creature to be this i wanted it to just really hit home how horrifying this creature was that mm. kind of thing so i mean that certainly works and it comes across like uh it comes across as a, like a grizzly, almost like a slasher movie, but with supernatural yeah. kind of slasher film. Yeah, it's a slasher. Basically, it's a Which slasher. Which made it one. also great fun to read as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Also, kind of like you know, uh, any kind of story where it's a there's a trap. You 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 know the rules of the trap. You know, if you walk onto the marshy bog, the, you're going to get killed. So how do you get out of the trap? That kind of thing. So yeah. I, I wanted to play with that element. Play well. with the rules and horror. Yeah. yeah, which are always good. I like the rules. Yeah, I like the rules. The rules let like you too. survive. You know, you can watch and learn the rules and survive the bogeyman. Yeah. Um, well, I really liked the bog. I thought mm. it was great fun. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting as well because 
when you're writing these characters as well, for the three uh, chaps who are themselves Irish, mm. and if they were a certain kind of Irish person like yourself would have some idea of the folklore mm-hmm. um, and of these things. Yeah. And it's interesting that you choose to write them as characters who are so detached mm-hmm. from their um, understanding or knowledge of the past or, yeah. or folklore. Almost like there's so much the subjects of modernity yeah. that they fall victim to Yeah. To because what the modernity doesn't provide them in this instance. <laughs> because obviously this creature appears as the old man first, and, mm. and you know if you know if you know your superstitions, if you know your mythology, if you're connected with your past, you know to give this man some help, mm. and he'll leave you alone. Whereas they're modern men, they don't have a clue, so they decide, nah, yeah, this is we're not doing this, and they kind of suffer mm. as a result of it. So it's kind of like. Not ignoring the past. It's, a, it's an interesting idea that you express, yeah. and I think you express that quite elegantly, mm-hmm. but also in a very fun way yeah. as well. Um, so no, that was a really, really enjoyable one. And when we go from the bog... To the below. The below, that's right. Mm-hmm. We go to page 187. Mm-hmm. It's a good, decent, thick-sized volume. It is. There's a lot of girth in this book, ladies. Um, Here we go. Wow. (laughs) Or gentlemen, to be fair. Mm -hmm. Or anything in between. So we have (laughs) have with the blow. Um, (laughs) And on this subject, (laughs) we are some Tom's... um, Gender neutral apparition. Mm-hmm. Um, now, this is a fantastic and hideous illustration. Mm-hmm. Mm. And I think the nature of your writing in, in this story is quite well, it, it tells a story, it, it puts us in the action. Yeah. But you're conveying a cosmic horror. Yeah. Um, and as one might expect, with the, the words you choose to describe that. There's mm. a certain poetic license when you're describing a, the a human psychological reaction to something so profound mm. and unnatural. Yeah. And so James... <laughs> <laughs> I took that. He's got to draw it. Yeah, like, got to draw like, how, it. Do you, yeah, how do you draw no, that? I, I don't blame him. It, it would be like not comparing myself in any way to it, but just as an example, you know, it's very... Uh, there's so many different illustrations of Lovecraft's creatures. Mm. And Lovecraft was not, he was a, quite a vague, that, quite, that's quite right. often a vague um, describer of, of, these, of these creatures. So, No, you're right. I think, I think James did the best thing. I think he, he decided to, to take his own poetic license sure. and just create an entity yeah. based on his feelings from reading your story mm-hmm. rather than trying to discern a specificity, yeah. specificity of yeah. um, And, uh, you know, it's interesting as well, like when we think of... Um, Lovecraft, as you say, and how indescribable many of his horrors are. Uh, that's actually one of the reasons that I was on the fence about uh, Guillermo del Toro and uh, mm-hmm. Mountains of Madness, yeah. because I know how much he fetishizes the small details, mm-hmm. and he would be as equally excited about the hardback compendium book of all his pre-production art design mm-hmm. as he would be the film, with perhaps, I think, scant regard, really, for the psychological aspects which mm. i've always thought was the most powerful about lovecraft mm. was how he could make you feel in the face of these indescribable mm. things or powers which is probably why it's not gonna in anyone's hands i don't think it would be no i mean the most famous lovecraft films really are well of course this is a whole conversation you could have but are often pastiches a little mm. bit or earnest cheerful slight parodies but um with with obvious respect for Lovecraft, you know films by uh, Stuart Gordon, like yeah. The Animator and The Beyond. And... I think being inspired by Lovecraft is a much better pursuit than adapting mm. a Lovecraft story. I think, I think the amount of the amount of films and 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 books that have been inspired by him, yeah, it, it's a much better pursuit than directly like adapting any of his stories. I think so. 
I actually think that oftentimes, uh, not all the time, and don't take offence, please, um, but American fandom for Lovecraft can fetishise the physicality of the descriptions and, mm. uh, and the creatures. Whereas the British tradition and horror, which is more steeped in psychological horror, mm. um, often champions those otherworldly and describable elements mm. of Lovecraft's writing, rather than whether the creature has 12 tentacles, mm -hmm. three eyes and... and Which is why you should watch True Detective season one. Yeah, fair <laughs> enough. Um, so, um, when we get to the below, um, well, <laughs> I mean, the below is totally, totally mental, as I would say. But um, tell us a little bit about the below. Um, it's inspired by my hometown, again. There's a, um, a neo-Gothic revival castle on the outskirts of my town. And it's basically just like um, a fancy mansion that was built in the 18th century. Right. Maybe 19th century. Um, but it has extensive grounds, huge grounds, like surrounded by a massive giant wall that goes for miles. And it's all forest. And it's quite a popular spot. And um, lots of things. Um, but um, there's always stories about the place, uh, that it was built on druidic grounds mm. and the castle is haunted and all that kind of stuff, which I think is just fascinating. Um, but I'm a skeptic and but one of my friends um, basically um, won't go in. Mm. Um, and um, I was... Uh, he he just won't step in. To, he just hesitates to go anywhere near the grounds because of just a, a, a horrible vibe he gets from the whole thing. Um, even though I'm a skeptic, I found that quite moving and disturbing. Mm -hmm. And it kind of because he's not he, he's not a person who who bullshits mm -hmm. uh, about stuff like that. So I kind of took that little seed and 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 wrote a story about. Um, a guy who works in a hotel in a kind of a that type of castle inspired castle and um, I incorporated elements because I used to be a member of an astronomical society in my hometown as well so I kind of included that um, and yeah it's just basically about um, an, an astronomical society who take over a hotel for a week in order to perform a ritual which goes very well works out perfectly works fine. out very well <laughs> and it's the one of the uh, the protagonist is a guy who works at the hotel who kind of accidentally stumbles upon a mystery and the creature as well with heartwarming consequences heartwarming consequences, heartwarming fun consequences. for all the family um out of these stories which do you feel was the most challenging to write um, probably, and it walked into the sea, which is my that's, favorite. It's one of the. It is really good, mm. and um, it has the most plot elements. Yeah. That's always difficult to untangle when you're yeah. writing sh any story. It has the most plot elements, and that was definitely why I was trying to wrestle how to. Like, I mean, I knew I, I knew how it would end, but sometimes you get stuck leading yourself towards the mm -hmm. end, you know, the middle part to the end part. So I kind of wrestled with that one for a couple of days before I could finish it. But um, it wasn't, it wasn't, I wasn't in turmoil. I didn't have a gun to my head or anything <laughs> like that. Or I, was, I wasn't drinking heavily. Would the, the, I mean, we don't need to be writing to do that anyway. No, no. that's true. I mean, would that story be the one you're most proud of in terms of your end? Yeah, I think it's the one, it's the one that, I find the most inviting mm -hmm. and it's the one that I feel I I crafted it. I, it when I look at it I feel like that's the one that makes me feel like a writer right the rest are good like they're very good but um this one I felt like I had a good a really good story mm. and a really good character and a really good creature and, and and I was yeah I was kind of firing on all cylinders on that one well, um, no, I agree. Well, thank you for talking to me about your wonderful short stories. Thank you. And have you got any advice you'd like to give to aspiring horror writers? Um, 
uh, have your ending done. Don't don't be like Stephen King. <laughs> <laughs> Just suddenly start writing, because he's he's you know he's able to do that and get away with it. But uh, I would have your ending. Uh, well, folks, if if you'd like to grab a copy of the book of Beastly Creatures, uh, you can get it on. Well, we have uh, hexarcanapublishing.com or we also have hexstudios.shop and we are also running a Kickstarter at the moment for one of our new books, the mm -hmm. one that Sean Hogan wrote. So you'll get a link there as well. You'll get a whole bunch of links. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe for more about our filmmaking and writing and uh, take care. <laughs>